Thanks, David, Scott, Joe, and everyone. They all got to thank you. And, and we got the hardest job. Now we need to speak something wise about Israel. But I'm excited to be here. Uh, we have a great panel, so we'll not go um, through introducing everyone again. But I want to, we'll go back to where the movie ends about the vintage, if that's the right vintage year, which is also true to MedTech, not just Israel. But let's go back to history, uh, kind of why Startup Nation. And, and maybe, David, I'll ask you, because you have a unique opinion, boy. MD, been in the US for a strategic company, investor, and then go back to a CEO of a startup company, innovative startup. Why Israel? Have so many startups, right? Meaning in uh, the movie we saw, the numbers are astonishing. Difficult to nail down the exact secret sauce, and I won't repeat what a lot of you already know, but I would say what I've encountered is really um, a lack of um, accepting the status quo. Uh, it's a really, uh, it's a very can-do um, attitude in terms of the culture. People continuously uh, identifying unmet needs, identifying new technologies, trying to match new technologies with unmet needs. And um, I would say that looking at the entrepreneurs that I've been involved with, um, it's really that continuous pursuit of bettering uh, technology, bettering people's lives. And I would say, uh, I will end with only one comment, we're actually seeing uh, a lot of migration of innovation and entrepreneurs from the traditional high tech that maybe Israel is better known for in terms of the semiconductors, internet, going back and trying to do good and be involved in the healthcare industry. And I think that that migration of talent from the traditional tech to healthcare is also helping us thrive within that sector. Yeah, that, that makes sense. It comes with some challenges, obviously, not accepting the status quo, and we're all evidence for running Israeli companies. Hila, going back to you, not to back, but going to you, is you work in the U.S. as an investor in growth, right, in private equity, and now we're the VC. Is that mindset change now going to Israel with the lesson you learned from the U.S. on innovation? Um. I would start with the fact that Israel initially was innovative from necessity, actually, more than anything else. We had to survive and we had to do well, otherwise we wouldn't be there. And then it's evolved from being a very small community of entrepreneurs that are trying to survive into understanding that the local market is very small and we have to approach the, world, the global market and to do better. And from a small island, we're becoming a big tanker that just pretty much sells across the world and provide solutions, not only to the Israeli ecosystem. So after spending about 20 years in the States, investing in different technologies and biotech, uh, coming back to Israel was just natural to see that the innovation and the growth is coming from within and the world can benefit from it. So bringing the world in and taking us outside, it's something that Israel is very good at and continuing to be very good at even during the current times. So I think it's gonna be just even better and better and exciting years ahead of us. And Chris, from your perspective, you've bought companies in Israel, you partner with companies, I'm probably sure you have some horror stories about working with Israeli, but we'll keep them to post panel after a drink. <laughs> uh, how do you see that, meaning from an innovation ecosystem in Israel? Yeah, I mean, I think the, the word that you said right there is ecosystem. And if you look at anywhere else in the world, that ecosystem isn't connected. In Israel, it's completely connected from the government, from the talent, from the investment side, from the strategics. Everything works in concert together. And all for the good, as David said, for patients, right? And, and it's all about driving that forward. And, and so to me, that's why Israel is so special. Um, you know, you heard Mikhail talk about on the video about after obviously the end of last year, the challenges, and now that community has come even tighter together. I couldn't imagine how them being even tighter than they were already, right? And so it's that spirit, it's that entrepreneurialness, um, it's that mindset that they win together and they work together to order to solve the, the challenges of the world. Yeah, and I'll just keep going to Jeannie. And David mentioned you bought PVT 20 years ago, which is a really long time. I remember doing the first case in France that was actually in Ramba Medical Center. How did you see PVT evolve from an Edwards perspective? You mentioned to me when we did the briefing before that it's part of your product life cycle. 
How does Edward see that? Yeah, so it has been a long time. So 2004, I mean, we still talk about an acquisition of PVT, but it has been integrated. So 2004, the company gets bought. Um, we held on to gratefully every employee that was at PVT. So I think kind of to what Chris said, there's a lot of compounding that happens, right? There is concentration of information, insight, and I, I'm a strategy person too, and I have that whole saying that, you know, culture eats strategy for whatever meal. <laughs> I think it's true, and it's a lot of it is the people. So when you take a technology that is just unique, most people thought it would fail, but you had a group of people who thought it couldn't. And then you have a company like Edwards at the time that knew that patient group, and the combination of the two was an explosion. So from 2004, we renamed the company because we've had a couple of really exciting acquisition, and it's been integrated. So that story of let's do PVT again is in our muscle. So as you think about other companies that get acquired, we hope to keep everyone. And I think we renamed the company, um, the group in Israel to EIIC, Edwards Innovation Center, Israel Innovation Center. So it goes to show just how much we mean that we need the technology, we need the people, we need the infrastructure. I kind of laugh that startup nation, I don't think of Israel as startup nation. Because if it were, I mean, look around this room. We've got a lot of cool startups here. Yeah. It's just that you think about how much that Israel has been able to offer, as Chris said, about the infrastructure, the government, et cetera. So the ecosystem is miraculous. And I'm glad to have been a part of it from an editor's perspective from the very beginning. You're in Israel more time than me, you, which is... <laughs> yeah. I'm jealous. Yeah. I mean, I do because... So here's a little fact for the small room here. My husband is French. I've been to Israel many, many, many more times than I've been to France. And I <laughs> go to Paris a lot. So it goes to show, you know, it's an important place. I remember COVID, when COVID happened, we tried to figure out how to get to Israel. And about a year after the full shutdown, we figured out how to go. And it was very hard. But it was so important. And two weeks, three weeks from now, I'll be back. So it's part of not just a, hi, I got to go see cool startups. Our team is there. One of the folks on my team works in Israel. So it's, it's part of my team. So we got to be there. That's amazing. Um, Shai, you run an incubator, right? So we spoke about government. We spoke about ecosystem. You probably see founders that are coming, not even from healthcare. How do you assess that ecosystem when a founder comes to you? from a different disciplinary, have a crazy idea, and you need to fund it. Yeah, I think that uh, we're really uh, a good example of that uh, ecosystem. Um, we, we, we run an, an incubator that is uh, supported by the Israel Innovation Authority. And it also is well connected to international strategic partners and is util utilizing the, the talent and the entrepreneurial spirit of, of uh, engineers and physicians in, uh, in Israel. And all, this all comes together in venture creation and building up of companies uh, for, you know, for, the last, uh, for the last few years. And we definitely see those, uh, I mean, there are um, uh, mature areas of innovation in Israel that are not medical, as, as uh, you may know, uh, in communication, in cyber. And it's nice to see some of this talent uh, come to us when they want to do, uh, as, as David mentioned, something which is impactful, something that will really change the world rather than, you know, maybe add a feature to a, to a cell phone. And that, this is where we are. And the, um, the uh, collaboration that we have with the Israeli Innovation Authority, this is really a very good example of a program of a government uh, employees that, are, that really understand innovation. Many of them come from the, the, the worlds of uh, VCs. And the, the communication with them is very open, is very flexible, and it's, it's, I think this is a unique, uh, a unique situation. And also something that gets improved over time and cha keeps changing, and that's also, some, I think, part of, this, of the secret sauce of never stand still and always you know, uh, think how to do something uh, a, little bit, uh, a little bit better. You know, there was, in the movie, a uh, great movie, by the way, there was uh, uh, some quotes from Shimon Peres, 
And uh, I, I just uh, jumped into my mind that there was another quote from him. He was asked, what do you think is the most important thing that the Jewish people have brought to the world? And he said, I think it's the, it's the feeling of dissatisfaction of the status quo. <laughs> and I think this is a really cool, and, and he, he said that in the, in the positive way, where there is really a lot of people of thinking, you know, uh, even when things are doing okay, how can I make it even better? So, so true. Um, so Chris, going back to you, what have changed, right? You and I have been meeting in the ICI for the last 17 or 18 years, I think, and I stayed in Boston, but you see people like Hila or David going back to Israel. But how did you see that ecosystem grow and change over the last decade? Yeah, I mean, obviously, there's a desire to give back to the to that ecosystem and to that community um, for for what it is offered for them, and so you do see people kind of coming back and and developing companies there, uh, building you know new new businesses and new technologies so that they can actually give others the opportunity that they once had. To, to ultimately, you know, go and experience some parts of the other world and bring that knowledge back to to Israel. Um, you know, I, I, I the way I look at at kind of you know all of this is Israel and the and the startup communities there are they have that can do attitude, but they also do it on a very cost effective and efficient way in order to actually get to inflection points to decide whether to continue on or to pivot, right? They don't ever stop. They pivot and think of a new way of ad addressing the same challenge or, or, or issue. And so they're constantly thinking about it. And so that, that knowledge that they gain from going outside of Israel and bringing it back adds to that continuous of that ecosystem. Yeah. And and when you look into that, is, is companies do pivot, right? And, and, and it's hard because, if, especially if a founder, you believe in what you do all the time. To pivot is really hard or even change positioning of a company and all that. Um, when you look into today, maybe Hilal, David, whoever wants to answer, what's the biggest challenge today in Israel, right? I Meaning, obviously, every medical device, it's funding, funding, funding. That's the reason we're all in LSI trying to do speed dating of 15 minutes intervals. But Forget about the macro right now. What's the biggest challenge in Israel right now when you establish a company like David that's going to pivotal or even start up early stage or allow when you invest in companies? <laughs> Challenges. We have plenty of those in Israel. <laughs> but I think that the one and the core thing that we feel currently is the kind of the disconnect a little bit from the rest of the world uh, to what we actually create and do in Israel. Um, I think that especially medical devices, we've seen it going through turns. Um, and it went a little bit out of favor in recent years, but I think that the innovation that comes up right now um, need to be recognized, need to be cooperated with the rest of the world, and I think that's one of our challenges. I think the second thing is, obviously, it's always been a challenge, but funding Israeli companies with the understanding that it's not for the local market. It's actually everything that is being innovated in Israel is going to the global market. So those are solutions that we reach out to the global markets. We see the needs outside of Israel and we are able to be thinking out of the box and creating the solutions. And that's not always being recognized by people that actually not part of this ecosystem. And the last thing I think is the talent. Uh, we have Israelis that have did companies have, you know, succeeded leaving the country, coming back, and those are the resources that we need as management that is very experienced, have done the capital markets, understand what the world needs, or understand go to market, and bring that back to Israel. So I would think that this will be the challenges that we are facing currently. And David, you run Pivotal, starting a Pivotal and EFS, all from Israel. So you're flying back and forth, you have a team on the ground, how does that work? So uh, for the early uh, clinical work, we, we did decide to support the cases from Israel, and so we're, we're flying back and forth. Um, we are we also a company that pivoted. I won't go, go through the full history of Magenta, but we do have the privilege now, and it is a privilege to work on an indication that is quasi-elective. So we have the 48 to 72-hour 
advance notice where we can actually get on planes. Not surprisingly, we did our early feasibility study in the New York metropolitan area because there are so many flights uh, back and forth and it allows us to be there. Um, obviously, when you scale up, um, and it's one of the challenges you were asking me before about the challenges, I think one of them related to Israeli companies is sort of the, the discipline of process, uh, which helps us a lot early on in the innovation process. It actually hurts us a little bit as we need to uh, prepare for uh, scale up, which is all about discipline and process orientation. And um, I've been contemplating this for a while, but certainly our definitive plan, and it's part of our fundraising strategy, is to build a team in the US to manage a pivotal study locally. At that scale, you cannot do it from afar. It has nothing to do with the current situation in Israel. It's just the practicality of managing a pivotal study from 7,000 miles away, which is just not doable. Jenny, did you see the same challenge in Edwards about moving from that innovation startup that everyone making coffee in the same time, they design a part, to a process organization that need to develop parts? All of it is super hard, but I do think focus helps. So you may try to sequester one group to work on something and another to work on something else. And I think part of that becomes, there's a challenge to that because if you're an innovator who started early, you want to keep going with the program, right? But you have to assume that maybe that skill set isn't maybe great. It's kind of like relay racing, right? It's the first runner really isn't maybe the best at second or third. And I do think it's a relay, and I do think that you have to find what works. Um, what's worked for us is taking the innovation, bringing a team here in Irvine, and if it's manufacturing, we've got places all over the world as well, and then connecting the two. And so time zone, we work through it. But fundamental to that is the patient. So you've got to use those kind of foundations to align people. I think sometimes we get so carried away with technology, someone's like, hey, I got a really great opportunity, we gotta fix A, B, C. But if you've been fighting really hard and saying that a patient population has absolutely no other options you wanna hold to make perfect, and I think this is where if you are working with engineers, that's a good conversation to have. So how do you, what part do you solve? What part do you hold? Um, and then the trust to keep that loop going. And a lot of that becomes an information sharing. So rooted in how we think about this is we bring back the clinical, the learnings back to the team. And then we sort of honor the different parts and the trust that we have. But it takes practice. And I think each team goes through its process. And it's like any time you join a new company or a new project, it takes a couple months. But I think we, if you're in it for the long run, you kind of, you realize that that is what it takes. And you kind of keep that, hopefully, with the end results. And we've seen it. By doing that, we've seen great results. So kind of stick with, I think, at the end of the day, what you're great at. And if you can kind of bypass the stuff that's kind of fun and that you think you might be good at, right, there's that discipline part. Shai, you brought Boston very early on to your incubator. I know Chris and Medtronic did the digital health in northern Israel. What's your rationale to bring them so early to that innovation phase? And, and the other question is, aren't you afraid that they will know everything and then you cannot sell to Chris or to Ginny? Yeah, it's a, it's a, good, it's a very good point. And I think uh, there is a lot of awareness on the, what David and Ginny were discussing about the later stage of the company where you need that uh, you know, across-the-ocean collaboration and how to resolve it, and the maturation that comes with that. But uh, we are trying to also address that early on, when we just are starting a project. And what we've, we were seeing is, you know, uh, very large uh, amounts of extremely talented engineers coming with amazing technologies for indication that nobody is interested in and are irrelevant to the US market. Uh, or maybe I'm exaggerating in some cases, but you could find that you know they were not tuned. They were close, but not really to the point. And the fact that uh, what we found is that those early discussions uh, with Boston, but also with others, we, are, we have a pretty wide collaboration now with, with uh, strategics. It is a tremendous um, um, uh, investment from them, uh, from the strategic side, uh, for very little, let's say, time investment, 
and uh, actually very little money as well in that stage, you can really tailor something to your unmet needs. And once you get this uh, openness and this uh, kind of process of working with the strategic, and there are challenges of community, communicating between the startup ecosystem and, and, and strategics, I what think you, you can do a lot done. <laughs> challenges uh, that, that can, over, can be overcome. And I think that uh, you can gain really a lot. And, and I think that this is something I would recommend to uh, you know, any strategics out there in the, in the crowd when you are discussing with Israelis you um, uh, try to address the, the kind of the, the, the grassroots of the unmet needs and guide them. And it's not always funding that they're after. Sometimes if you give them uh, the right advice, it will be worth much more than you know, the first million dollars. Maybe they will not agree, but... Uh, <laughs> Depends who you ask, right? <laughs> Uh, so let's move a little bit. I'm just looking at the time here. Um, towards, yeah, there's a clock here. <laughs> you have another panel, right? <laughs> I do. Um, Chris, you also invest in companies directly, and you have an innovation center there. How do you decide, meaning where to put the money, where to put the resource, how to share that when you look into innovation? Yeah, I mean, so when we look at um, you know the region, right, we, we obviously want to continue to make investments there. Um, and grow our footprint in Israel. And so when we, when we look at both our organic investments that we're making, we are evaluating whether we're making investments and in expanding our teams into Israel or in other parts of the world, um, is, uh, India, US, wherever it is, China, right? That's all part of the, the, the calculus for us is where is the right skill set, the right expertise, um, that will deliver what we're trying to solve for. And we then obviously on the inorganic side, we're uh, looking at how do we use our existing team in Israel to help us when we're doing diligence in Israel um, and understand that subject matter expertise uh, to do that type of work in, in country uh, and then add that capability to our skill set within, within Israel. And so it, it is a multifaceted kind of, uh, you know, process that we're looking at and evaluating in terms of building out our skill set there. Now we have, I think it's close to 2,000, 2,500 employees in Israel. Um, that's mostly through acquisition, Mazor, Given Technology, uh, Given Imaging, um, Cat, you know, Cathworks, we basically are, are employees of ours almost, um, just a matter of time. Um, <laughs> So we got to work through that, but um, you know, and the, obviously there were other acquisitions that we did uh, along the way, Neutrino and et cetera, that we've added different capabilities, uh, all based on their capabilities and their knowledge and technology, um, and how they're adapting it into the into the medical field. Yeah, and when you look in, in the way I look at in innovation in Israel, it's kind of following the leader. There's a good company that stand with the first one, then everyone did cardiovascular. And then everyone shift to digital health, right? And everyone shift to whatever the trend is. And it's a question to everyone who wants to ask is uh, answer, what should Israel focus or the innovative? Is it next generation product, maybe like you are doing, David? Is it new therapy, new innovation, uh, breaking the status quo in things that you don't know how to solve right now? How do you guys think about that? Um, if this is a call for what everyone should be working on next, I think part of it, I'll go back to what's look, I guess, closely on one of the things that you want to solve. I mean, that video showed some alarming things around stroke cardiovascular. I mean, I think those are still really important things. I think if you think about trends, uh, maybe you guys set them. Maybe Israel sets them. Maybe I, I haven't seen things be a fad. If it were, then I would question it. But I do think that you, you lean real heavy into the areas of focus. And so keep doing that. I mean, I think it's all about the wealth of experience. And so if there is talent there, continue that talent. Um, I'll, I'll say things that may not be things that I would, I'll go out on a limb here. For example, manufacturing. I don't know if, someone laughed there. Um, I don't know if that's an area of, of focus per se, because there's other areas and other regions that might, on the level of innovation, might be better. All those things you said, yeah, they're super important. Digital, all of those aspects are really key, but I think it's a lot about 
setting the right trends and where, where you go deeper, where you look at the patient, where you look at those fundamental needs and making sure to, I don't know, double down, triple down there, because that's really where the heart is. So I tend to want folks who know things to go deeper in them versus, hey, let's try something different. I have been in this space for, I don't know, close to 30 years. There's something about, I can spot certain things, right? I've got teams who are great, and over the course of time, their gut gets better, and a lot of that is what, what we want. So if you think of the startup nation that had the gut for it, and the resilience, then I'd say trust your gut more than maybe, I guess, asking me, right? You want to say something, Chris? Well, I was just going to give, uh, obviously, there's a lot of work being done kind of in the imaging world, right? Um, but I think that, that that is a core competency of Israel that actually can have major and material impact on a global basis having that next gen of imaging technology that can democratize all of the therapies that everybody's working on, either through image guided, through AI, through data, whatever you know, uh, enabling technology there is, I think there's a core fundamental expertise in Israel that can really be leveraged on a, on a global basis for everybody's benefit. Nothing from Israeli folks. Go. Go uh, maybe one a little bit different uh, aspect is uh, I think that uh, something that I see is uh, maybe moving a little bit earlier into these states. So you know, people were uh, there is a long, uh, for many years talk about prevention, of course, and treating the patient when there is already a crash. And I think there is awareness and there is understanding also of the economic value and not to mention the clinical value of uh, some earlier, milder intervention that will prevent kind of the catastrophe. And that's also kind of a general area we are looking at in different disease states. So, so in the last couple of minutes, switch focus, right? I'm actually in Boston, but you know, the other side of the pond, but uh, what does Israel need from the US side, right? What support does it need from the ecosystem to continue generating innovation, to continue generate startups? Obviously funding, but that's true to 95% of the people here whether they're funds or startups, right? It's for the only one is strategic, they don't need funding. But how do you guys think about that? David, Hila, from... I know you wanted to skip funding, but I want to spend 30 oh, seconds on it. Go for it. Um, sure, it's trivial, everybody's looking for funding, but, but I will just say as, as a message to the funds here in the crowd and, and certainly looking at our own investors, I, I think we need to find better ways of um, making sure that there is no um, concerns about investing far away from the US. And it's not about geopolitics, it's not about where we are. We know there's, I know that there's the prevailing joke of some funds that prefer not to invest outside of their zip code. And so certainly Israel is not in the zip code of, uh, of Sand Hill Road, but I would uh, encourage uh, US-based funds to be a little bit more open-minded uh, about that. And so I think that's, uh, that's an important message. The other one, um, that I would say is getting back to what I intimated before about the process and discipline. Certainly some of the benefits of aligning Israeli startups with the strategics and with the sophisticated healthcare investors in the US is that awareness of scale up early in building the companies, making sure that both the talent and the physical infrastructure is built in order to support the technology through uh, advanced clinical studies and maybe sometimes even through commercialization because we know we all know of the trend the thresholds for acquisitions have just increased with years um, and um, and companies are being bought at a more mature stage Ela, from your perspective how do you think about that beside direct flight that United finally flying back to Israel right now <laughs> I, I'm, I'm not sure I can say exactly what we need from the U.S. I think that the U.S. has to look at us, um, you know, as part of Pitango, we've been around for 30 years. It's actually uh, probably the, almost like the most mature and, and experienced uh, VC in Israel. And we do see uh, more and more recently uh, funds coming from the U.S., even first time funds that never have done any business in Israel and looking to co-lead with us and looking to invest in Israeli companies. I think the process is a lot 
harder because there is still that building the trust, building the acknowledgement of how in-depth due diligence we do do to our companies and we can provide a lot of this input to the US investors that are coming in. So I think what I would like to see more is that cooperation, you know, the need to listen to one another. We will benefit with what we can bring to the table, the experience, the access to those technologies, the access to those entrepreneurs, and then to bring it from the US, the need to learn about reimbursement, penetrating the market, how to go to market, um, and obviously the capital market in the end as an exit strategies. But I really believe there's so many opportunities. We alone see over a thousand companies a year in Pitango, just in health tech. So we have a lot to offer and it's just to be open-minded and come and join us on this exploration. Well, thank you and, uh, and I wanna thank first the panel, I'm just trying to wrap up so it'll be a little bit, not too much delayed, but thanks everyone for joining us. Uh, I, I'm biased, but I believe it's the right time to invest in Israel. In medtech, it's a macro, but Israel specifically. I think Israel have shown, like uh, shown in the movie, that they will prevail. Crisis is the right time to innovate and to think outside of the box. Israel have shown to be good in that. And in the end of the day, whatever you hear about Israel, I can tell you that 99.9% .9 of the people just want peace. Uh, so I want to make sure that everyone understand that, that that's the number one priority, and then change healthcare. But thank you very much, everyone.